Man, the Royal Rumble is my favorite pay-per-view of the entire year. And the meaning of it, to me, is very exciting. The prestige of the Royal Rumble, to me, is very exciting. The anticipation and the unpredictability and the surprise, the element of surprise, is what makes the Royal Rumble, for me, the best pay-per-view that WWE does all year, whether it's good or bad. In, in previous years, it's been bad. In previous years, it's been bad because WWE seemingly forgot how to book a great Royal Rumble. WWE back in the day used to use the Royal Rumble as a catalyst to build feuds and internal struggle between a few different superstars that eventually led to a WrestleMania match. The Royal Rumble itself, the winner of the Royal Rumble, would be in the main event of WrestleMania. That has changed over the years, especially in modern day WWE. You no longer win the Royal Rumble in main event WrestleMania. You get a title shot at WrestleMania. Not really the same thing. Now, that all depends on who wins the Royal Rumble. If WWE sees you as a main event guy, then you'll main event WrestleMania. If you're one of these B-level guys that WWE wants to throw a bone to, then you ain't getting the main event. You're getting, you're getting fourth match down from the top. Fourth match down from the main event of WrestleMania. It's not really how things should be, but in WWE's political landscape, that's the way they want it to be. And they don't even realize that they're ruining the prestige, they're ruining the meaning, they're ruining the special aspect that is the Royal Rumble. Now, another thing I like about the Royal Rumble is the fact that the match could make a WWE superstar, a relative unknown could enter that match and have rapid-fire eliminations. He could eliminate a big name, and that big name can start a feud with a little name, and that feud could eventually get the relatively unknown guy over to a larger audience. Or someone like an undercard guy, relative unknown, could win the Royal Rumble and surprise everybody. The underdog smaller guy in the big man's world wins the Royal Rumble and goes on to WrestleMania, and is made into the next big thing in WWE. There's always the aspect of that, too, but when has WWE done that? It's been a very, very long time since WWE has done that, and I don't think that's a route that they are likely to go in, especially this year, coming up in 2019. This Royal Rumble may be the most politically driven Royal Rumble of all time. This Royal Rumble may lead us to one of the worst WrestleMania main events, if not the worst WrestleMania main event of all time. And you're going to have to do better than what we've seen in recent years with Roman Reigns to top those disasters. Boy, does WWE have it on their list to blow every one of those matches out of the water. If you're listening to me right now, no matter where you are, if you're watching me on YouTube, on whatever device you are watching me on, this Royal Rumble and WrestleMania season may be the most politically driven garbage we have ever seen in WWE. They gave us the Roman coronation. He's already the universal champion. Now we're going to do another coronation, and another passing of the torch. After how many passings of the torch have we seen already? Triple H, John Cena, The Undertaker, Brock Lesnar. How many? How many will it take for WWE to realize that this is a fucking waste of time? A complete waste of time that everybody watching me doesn't give a flying fuck about. And I'm telling you right now, it is October 1st. If you are one of these fucking people in the community that is excited about what you're about to see at WrestleMania, you should just fucking quit altogether. 
Your opinion is absolutely fucking worthless to me. Absolutely invalid. It's not even a fucking opinion at that point. That is downright fucking stupidity. Get ready, people. It's coming. If it doesn't come, I would absolutely be fucking shocked that it doesn't come. The 2019 Royal Rumble winner is said to be a repeat winner. We're going to go over the list of names who have repeatedly won the Royal Rumble, and we're going to narrow it down to who's going to win the 2019 Royal Rumble. Now, the Royal Rumble is only four months away. In the proper wrestling booker's mindset, It's not too early to be thinking about the Royal Rumble. WWE should already have half of the WrestleMania card fleshed out. The build for the Royal Rumble will begin sooner rather than later. With so many special events coming up, things are moving quickly in the WWE, and January will be here before we even blink. Now, last year we saw Shinsuke Nakamura eliminate Roman Reigns. Surprisingly, they still had to give you a fucking heart attack. Eliminate Roman Reigns to secure a title shot against AJ Styles, but he went on to lose at WrestleMania in New Orleans and failed to capture the WWE Championship altogether in a three-month feud that ruined Nakamura. So Nakamura won the Royal Rumble. We all thought that was going to be his coronation. We all thought WWE was going to get behind this big major signing that they took away from New Japan. No, they fucking ruined it. They absolutely fucking ruined it, and Nakamura has been garbage Ever since, even with a heel turn that kind of looked good for a little bit, but now, looking back on everything, makes no sense whatsoever. The match, the match itself with Styles and Nakamura was overshadowed, uh, you know, by literally everything at WrestleMania because they didn't make it a big deal. WWE wanted to make it a big deal. They, they tried to perceive it as a big deal. Oh, we'll give the fans the fantasy match, and what happened? The match was one of the worst matches on the entire show. Now, the Royal Rumble was pretty much a big deal anyway, even though Nakamura and Asuka won the Women's Royal Rumble. You know, the Royal Rumble event itself was a big deal, the debut of Ronda Rousey, and then obviously the Women's Royal Rumble that Asuka won was the first ever Women's Royal Rumble, and you could probably expect the Men's Royal Rumble going into this year to headline, because they had to get that fucking... You know, that niche out of the way. All the women, first time ever. Got to put them in the main event. Or Ronda Rousey's debut, we got to put it in the main event. It's got to be the last thing people see. So, that's not going to happen this year. Now, Daniel Bryan recently was discussing the venue of the show. And he was at Chase Field in Arizona. And that could hold up to 50,000 people. And he was asked about the possibility of superstars entering the match via the dugouts. That would be his vision of how people would come out as they're introduced for the Royal Rumble. Now, the Twitter account that is gaining popularity every single week, WrestleVotes, who I know people who know the people who run this account, they have claimed some big scoops over the past year, such as being the first to announce that Neville had walked out of the WWE and have stated that the company already has a winner in mind for the Royal Rumble match. This is not the first time that they have spoken of this, but it was brought up again. And this is news. These guys, these guys are in the know. That's all I'm going to say. They're in the know. Okay? Now, before I even say anything, plans change in this company. I mean, plans are changing right now in this fucking company. Right now, they don't even have a script for Monday Night Raw completed. Things change. Take it with a grain of salt. Now, plans will change undoubtedly between now and January, but they gave you one big clue as to who will win the Royal Rumble. Now, they've stated to a fan who asked if they knew the winner of the Royal Rumble, and they say, and I quote, let's just say as of now, it's a repeat winner. Judging from current storylines, any of the current active past winners would probably be pretty underwhelming. 
Now, Nakamura has been underwhelming since his feud with AJ Styles, and 2017 winner Randy Orton has turned back into a sadistic heel. But at this moment, there would be better options on the SmackDown roster for a winner. Now, Roman Reigns is the Universal Champion. He will be the Universal Champion going into WrestleMania. He is out of the question. Thank God. Because if I had to sit through another Roman Reigns Royal Rumble victory, holy shit. The 2015 Rumble, you thought that was bad. Thank God we're not getting that in 2019. Like I said, he's currently the Universal Champion, and he is expected to hold that for God knows how long. The other repeat winner here, currently on the active roster, is Sheamus. And he is the only other active full-timer who has won a Royal Rumble. And uh, this is in no disrespect to Sheamus. I think Sheamus is fucking great. And I love what he's done with Cesaro. But there's no fucking way in hell Sheamus is going to win the Royal Rumble. So that eliminates him. Okay, so actively, let's look at this realistically, actively, Nakamura is not winning the Royal Rumble, Roman Reigns can't win the Royal Rumble because he's not going to be in the Royal Rumble, he is the Universal Champion, and Sheamus is not going to win the Royal Rumble because he is not going to factor in world title situations. Now that leaves all the part-timers who have won Royal Rumble. We have Triple H, John Cena, Batista, The Undertaker, Rey Mysterio, Brock Lesnar, Shawn Michaels, and The Rock. Out of all those names, who do you think is the most likely to win the Royal Rumble and main event? WrestleMania. It's not going to be Triple H. They ain't going to do Triple H versus AJ Styles or whomever the WWE champion is. They're not going to do Triple H versus Roman Reigns again. Batista? We're not going to get Batista versus anybody on SmackDown Live or against Roman Reigns. John Cena? Sorry, bro. You ain't going to win the Royal Rumble. The Undertaker? Been there, done that. Rey Mysterio, sorry. Mr. 619 is going to be in other plans for WrestleMania. Brock Lesnar, he ain't winning the Royal Rumble. We've seen that already, and his time is over. And he will probably be, at this time next year, getting ready for Daniel Cormier. Shawn Michaels, WWE is not going to put Shawn Michaels into the Royal Rumble while they have dream matches planned for Shawn Michaels up until WrestleMania. To get the most out of Shawn Michaels, they don't need him to win the Royal Rumble. He's not coming back to win the world title. He's coming back to make money and give us dream matches. Or at least that's what WWE supposedly has planned. That leaves one person and one person only, folks. Dwayne Johnson. Now, we don't know Dwayne Johnson's schedule for 2019. We don't know if he's going to be embroiled in another Hollywood major film that's going to take six months out of his life. I don't know. But you certainly do know what Vince McMahon is currently dreaming of every night he lays his head down on his pillow. Do you know what Vince McMahon wants to main event WrestleMania? You know that Vince McMahon has it in the back of his mind Everything's gotta be done for Roman. This is, if this is exactly what these guys are talking about at WrestleVotes, a repeat winner, this is going to be the most politically charged Royal Rumble ever. Ever. If The Rock comes back at the Royal Rumble and wins the Royal Rumble, you don't think that's gonna blow up in WWE's face? What happened with Batista? What's going to happen with The Rock? Now, Batista ain't no Rock. I understand that. But you think the fans are that fucking stupid. Now, it, it all depends if WWE announces The Rock before the Royal Rumble. Which, if I'm doing, I'm probably not going to announce The Rock before the Royal Rumble. 
they did that with Batista. And if WWE is smart, they wouldn't follow the same blueprint that they did for Batista. Because if The Rock comes back and announces himself in the Royal Rumble, who the fuck do you think is going to win the Royal Rumble? And who the fuck do you think the fans are thinking of when they think about winning the Royal Rumble? That is a disaster waiting to happen. So it would be in WWE's best interest to not announce Dwayne Johnson for the Royal Rumble. It's going to come out at number 30, and what the fuck's going to happen? He's going to win the whole fucking thing. And, you know, the Royal Rumble is one of those events where all the smart mark guys, or all the smart mark wrestling fans, go to sit in attendance because it's one of the major pay-per-views of wrestling all year. So if The Rock comes out at number 30, you don't think that there is still going to be some type of backlash when he comes out at number 30? You don't think there's going to be some type of backlash? You don't think the fans are going to realize what WWE is doing here? You know, believe it or not, you know, maybe to some shill who don't know any fucking better, who has WWE cock stuffed up their fucking ass, this is not a dream match in anyone's book for WWE. This is a dream match to one man and one man only, Vince McMahon. This is nothing but a politically charged bullshit initiative. And what a fucking way to ruin the Royal Rumble. The Royal Rumble is not supposed to be used as a catalyst to drive a fucking political initiative. You're shitting on everybody else that has one night out of the year to prove themselves to the WWE to win that fucking Royal Rumble. You could still do that, but it will it will ultimately go nowhere because they've already determined that The Rock is going to challenge Roman Reigns for the Universal Championship at WrestleMania. You know, The Rock wasn't that great of a wrestler. He really wasn't. He was all show. He was, or, or is, one of the greatest of all time, but not because of his wrestling ability. This is going to be the same thing as The Rock versus John Cena at WrestleMania that we've seen twice. Both guys are not leaders. Both guys will be dancing on the other's feet. There's not going to be a proverbial ring general in that ring. If you thought The Rock versus John Cena was bad, wait till you get The Rock versus Roman Reigns. Just like how Roman Reigns and John Cena was a fucking terrible match and nothing but fucking finishers four times over. You're going to get the same thing in this match with Dwayne Johnson. You think Dwayne Johnson's going to go out of his way to fucking wrestle Roman Reigns to a five-star classic? Or are you going to see people's elbows and you're going to see his mannerisms and you're going to see, you know, all the other fucking bullshit that got himself over? Rock bottoms and all this other fucking bullshit. Come on, man. It's going to be rock bottoms, people's elbows, Superman punches, spears. But that's what you fucking goons in 2019 call a WrestleMania spectacle. This is fucking horrendous. Get ready, folks. It's coming. It's coming. I don't need no fucking crystal ball. I don't need to go on social media and some fucking idiots call me out for, for predicting, oh, this was going to happen anyway. Everybody predicted this. I don't need any of that. It's coming. The Rock versus Roman Reigns for the Universal Championship at WrestleMania in one of the most politically driven bullshit main events that this company has ever put together. The Royal Rumble will be fucking ruined because of their Roman Reigns initiative and this shit is going to get more nauseating as the months go on. A repeated winner for the Royal Rumble? There's only one man in the back of WWE's mind. There's only one man in the back of Vince McMahon's mind. There's only one man on the tip of his cock. Now there's Roman Reigns and The Rock at WrestleMania. Bullshit. Let me see you people get excited about this. I will laugh, laugh, laugh till my heart fucking can't take it anymore over you fucking idiots who are going to enjoy this garbage awaiting us in New Jersey. This is off the script. Didn't really expect to get something out there for part three, but it's fucking here. And you know what? Let's hit the introduction. I'll be right back with the rest of the news and rumors this week, and we'll talk about everything that you want to hear. 
As far as news and rumors, right here on part three for episode 241, this is Off the Script. Off this shitty fucking product by coming on here and speaking the fucking goddamn truth about this fucking filth. And I can book a better show taking a fucking dump after eating my fucking Chipotle chorizo with extra cheese. I don't give a fuck. Have I ever? Of course not. WWE is great, eh? Uh, fuck you, Japan, and, uh, Canada, oh, Canada! Ah, Tony! What is your bitch? Can I suck your dick? What is your life, bitch? And this is the number one fucking podcast! Right here! On YouTube.com! Is off the script. Man, what a busy week it's going to be, man. It's going to be a very, very busy week here. And I honestly wish all my weeks were this busy. Because I think I thrive better when there's just a lot going on. And with this show today, and then Monday Night Raw Review tonight, SmackDown Live, NXT, and then the Mae Young Classic, man. You guys have, like, that's the half a week right there. That's not even including the weekend. So, when we get to the weekend, Thursday, I'm going to be at the New York City Comic Con. And I'll be there pretty much all day. I'll be doing what I need to do there. They actually were gracious enough to give me four-day press badges uh, for the entire weekend. I'm not going to be able to do the entire weekend. But I will be there if you guys are going to be in and around New York City Comic Con and you come across me, you know, I will be there for sure. So we'll probably be doing that on Thursday. Friday, we're going to be doing the Super Showdown Preview and Predictions right here on Off The Script 242. Friday, I may make my way over to Comic Con as well. Not really sure on Friday morning because Friday night is what I'm really looking forward to, man. House of Glory. Extreme Warfare, October 5th, Callahan, Bully Ray, PCO, Anthony Gangone, the two big main events for that show, Women's Championship, Kimberly returns to House of Glory to go one-on-one with Sonya Strong, and then LAX, they will be defending the House of Glory Tag Team Championships against ACH and Rich Swan. so it's going to be a great fucking show, man, should be about eight or nine matches in total. If you guys want to come on out, I'll be there for sure. HOGWrestling.net. Tickets are still available. And then Saturday, clearly we have the Super Showdown. WWE from Melbourne, Australia. That is 5 a.m. on Saturday morning. So I'll be watching that live. Yes, I'm going to attempt to watch that live. I don't know how I'm going to do it. I may have to inject myself with fucking coffee for the entire morning. But the show will be spanning five hours long. We got confirmation on that in the news today. But I will be live tweeting at 5 a.m. during Super Showdown. We'll be doing the review. Now, I'm not really sure how off the script is going to be this weekend. I'm not sure if the review is going to be part two of off the script. It depends on how much news and, and rumors are available that weekend. We may just do the review on Saturday and then continue the podcast on Sunday and Monday. I'm not really sure yet, but I will definitely let you guys know the uh, closer we do get to the weekend. We'll take it as a uh, day-by-day uh, situation. So... All that stuff's coming up this week, man. Going to be a very, very busy week, and I'm looking forward to just dive into it because, like I said, I thrive in the the busyness of the work week here. You know, it, it, uh, it actually makes me work harder, and it keeps my mind off shit that I shouldn't be thinking about. So, can't wait to dive into the busy week, man. We'll start with this, and then tonight, Monday Night Raw, as always, the final go-home show before Super Showdown. There was a podcast on uh, Friday and Sunday, so if you guys want to go check that out, well, actually, no, Friday and Saturday, not Sunday, Sunday we did Spider-Man, Friday and Saturday, so if you guys want to go check that out, parts one and two are linked in the annotation that you see in the top right corner, part one, man, you guys absolutely loved part one, that big, big, big rant on Brie Bella and other people in the community. So go check that out. Links will be in the annotation that you see in the top right corner of your screen. Um, Part two 
I don't know if YouTube pushed the video because part two did half of what part one did. And I hate seeing my numbers like that, man, because if part one did almost 30,000 views and like 2,600 likes and part two only did half of that, that means half of the people that watched part one didn't get part two. That's a pretty staggering number. So I don't really like that. So if you guys missed part two, it's there. Go check it out. Make sure you guys are subscribed down below. Turn on the bell for all notifications. And follow me on Twitter, man. That is your best bet, pretty much, to keep up to date on all the content here on the channel. At JD from NY206. Quickly, man, let me go over my sponsors, as always, here for the podcast. Barbershopwindow.com slash off the script. Get your merchandise. That is barbershopwindow.com slash off the script. Bshop20 for your coupon code, man. Save 20% off. And I can't wait to unveil the new 100,000 subscriber t-shirt, man. It is coming, and it's coming very, very soon. We just hit 98. Uh, we're at 98,050, I believe. So make sure you guys go get your t-shirts, man. The best-looking t-shirts in the podcasting wrestling game right now is on Barbershop Window off the script. So go check that stuff out. Harry's, harrys.com slash script. You're going to get a free trial, shave set. Uh, on the house, just for listening to the show, man. Harrys.com slash script. They're going to give you a razor blade, a razor handle, protective case for your blade, and a bottle of their foaming shave gel, which soothes and hydrates. And it smells fucking fantastic, man. Harry's is the best shave of your entire life, guaranteed. They are so confident in that, they want you to try it for free. I've been using it for six months. I love it. Haven't used anything else, and I guarantee you guys will feel the same, man. I never, ever, ever, ever put my name to anything that I don't truly believe in. Never put my name to something that I don't use. I use this every single week, and I know you guys will do the same, man. Harrys.com slash script. They're with us for the entirety of 2018, man. So harrys.com slash script. Audible. Audible's been a fine friend of the podcast, man. They've been with me for about a year and a half now. Audibletrial.com slash off the script. Go get your free uh, trial for Audible. One month free. That's 30 days free and one free audiobook of your choice. You have over 200,000 choices to choose from, a lot of which are wrestling related, man. So you guys can really choose anything you want. And if you guys don't like Audible, if you feel like the service is not for you, you guys can cancel it any time within the 30-day grace period, and you still get to keep your audiobook for free, man. That's audibletrial.com slash off the script. And thank you guys on Patreon, man. You guys are blowing Patreon out of the water, man. You guys are great. If you want to sign up for the Patreon, patreon.com slash JD from NY206. I'm surprised I even have a show today, man. I waited and I waited and I'm like, you know what? Let's do a part three because I do have enough ru uh, news and rumors to cover an entire show. So we did cover the 2019 Royal Rumble. We did that. According to Russell Votes, it's going to be a repeat winner. Went on my little rant there. I don't really approve of it. I don't really appreciate it. The Royal Rumble should not be used in that manner. But we're getting Dwayne Johnson probably winning the 2019 Royal Rumble. So we went over that. The other big news that I didn't really know of and I found out yesterday from Dave Meltzer, a top Ring of Honor star is headed to WWE. So this one immediately perked my ears up. Who could it be? So Punishment Martinez just recently finished up with Ring of Honor. He finished up with Ring of Honor on Saturday night. He dropped the Ring of Honor Television Championship to Jeff Cobb. His contract with Ring of Honor expired a few weeks ago, and he opted not to sign a new deal with Ring of Honor, and now is a free agent. Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter confirmed that Martinez, 36 years of age, doesn't look it at all, is headed to the WWE. Now, Punishment Martinez has been wrestling since 2014, and he began by training at the Monster Factory in New Jersey. His first appearance with Ring of Honor was in 2015. There is no word yet on when he will officially start with WWE, but presumably, I think we're all under the assumption that he will go through NXT before making his main roster debut. Now, he could debut on the next set of TV tapings, or WWE might hold him off until after NXT TakeOver Los Angeles in November. But no matter where and when he debuts, he is headed to WWE probably 
NXT, which obviously would be the best bet for him to get him situated and get him familiar with how WWE does things. NXT is what it is, you know, because of situations like this. You're not going to put anybody like Punishment Martinez on the main roster. He is not that big of a name. You know, he's got a great look, and I think he could do very, very well in the WWE. And I think he's going to make his way through NXT before they even get him ready for the main roster, man. So this is something that obviously was that that obviously was on his bucket list. You know, he didn't opt to sign with Ring of Honor because he thinks he's good enough to be in NXT. He thinks he's good enough to be in the WWE. And one of my favorite things is watching guys grow, mature, and get to that next level. That's why I love NXT so much. It's one of the many, 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 many reasons why I love NXT. Having Punishment Martinez in NXT, man, and watching him grow even further, it's going to be great. And I think he's going to do very well there. He's got, the, he's got a great look. He's got the size to be, to be dominant there. You know, he does remind a lot of people of Baron Corbin, or, or at least what Baron Corbin could have been. You know, he's got that, that really, 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 you know, dark, you know, metal-esque look. And it's going to be very interesting to see how WWE, you know, presents and portrays Punishment Martinez. We don't even know if he's going to keep the name Punishment Martinez, man. WWE may change his name up. We don't know. But all we know is that this is going to be a very exciting time for anybody that's a fan of Punishment Martinez. He's headed to the WWE. I think this is a great deal. And again, it just goes to show you, man, no matter who you are, WWE is going to scoop you up and they're going to bring you on board because they don't want you staying or going to another company that they consider rivals. So, Punishment Martinez, man, coming to the WWE. We talked about Super Showdown. We talked about it being this Saturday. We know it's going to be a major event for WWE in an international market. How long is it going to be? And the fact that I am going to risk waking up at 5 a.m. on Saturday morning, Eastern Time, to watch this shit, and it be five hours long. It is going to be a daunting task, man. WWE Network has updated its schedule for next week and revealed that the WWE Super Showdown event on October 6th will run from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. with no pre-show. Now, the matches are as follows. The Undertaker versus Triple H. John Cena and Bobby Lashley versus Elias and Kevin Owens. That's a house show match if i ever seen one. AJ Styles versus Samoa Joe for the WWE title. No DQ. No count out. SmackDown Women's Championship, Becky Lynch versus Charlotte. Daniel Bryan versus The Miz, number one contender for the WWE Championship. The Shield versus Braun Strowman, Dolph Ziggler, and Drew McIntyre. Ronda Rousey and the Bella Twins versus The Riot Squad. The New Day versus The Bar for the SmackDown Live Tag Team Championships. Asuka versus, or Asuka and Naomi versus The Iconics. And probably the one match outside of Triple H and The Undertaker that I'm looking forward to is the Cruiserweight Championship, Buddy Murphy versus Cedric Alexander. Now, I hope that those guys get ample enough time on a five-hour show to showcase what they could really do. Because if it's anything like their first match, you're going to have a match that steals the entire show. So I can't wait to see what those guys do, especially Buddy Murphy being from Australia. It's going to be fucking awesome, man. You know, it's going to be a newsworthy show. Is it worth five hours? Probably not. Is it worth for you to wake up at 5 a.m. to watch this thing live? Probably not. I'm doing it because I have to for you guys. So, Super Showdown happening on Saturday, October 6th. It's going to be five hours long. A little bit too long for my liking if you ask me. One of my favorite tag teams in NXT, man, the Street Profits. The Street Profits, Montez Ford. Angelo Dawkins, Charisma Out the Ass, a team that I would love to see reach the heights of NXT Championship Gold. Now, we don't know what's happening with Montez Ford. If you're a fan of Street Profits and you watched their match with the Mighty on Wednesday's edition of NXT, it looked like Montez Ford tweaked his knee or blew out his knee, and he's going to be out. I really haven't heard anything from this particular set of tapings, it may just be storyline. I don't know, but it's either he's legitimately hurt or is he, or he's a damn good actor. But I heard a lot of people in and around the social media realm saying that Montez Ford is legitimately hurt. And I hope that's not the case. 
But the reason why I'm mentioning the Street Profits is because Mike Johnson of PW Insider recently brought them up in a discussion and he was talking about the Street Profits possibly being added to the New Day Act. Now, the New Day has been together for, what was it, almost five years now? Four and a half years, five years? And they've been successful ever since they they came together. There was some doubt there with the New Day, but ultimately, all three of their characters just shined through, and they became a major, major, major act on WWE television. You know, but how long, realistically, does the New Day have? How long does the New Day have to, to, to be in that boat and stay fresh? Like, when are the fans going to get tired of the New Day? Like, we don't know. That could, that could be tomorrow, that could be next week, that could be next year. We don't know, you know? Some people are already getting bored of the New Day. Some people already are stating that they don't want to see the New Day anywhere near Tag Team Championship gold right now, especially, for the, especially right now, when there are other teams on that roster that could benefit from being Tag Team Champions. There is always a chance that WWE would eventually want to freshen things up with the New Day, maybe break them up. We don't know. Maybe add new people to the group, take some that are there right now in the New Day, move them on to singles runs, and then add to the New Day. We don't know. It was discussed during a PW Insider Elite audio update that NXT's Street Profits have that special something needed to break out on the main roster. But if they were going to be implemented as members of the main roster, they could be in prime position to break out as members of the New Day. Now, he says, and I quote, If at some point on SmackDown, if the New Day becomes stale, if you put Dawkins or Ford in there as something to add uh, to the group, it could add a little pep to what the New Day has going on right now. End quote. It was also noted that it had nothing to do with race, which, you know, will be some fucking idiot in the comment section. Oh, why, why are you going to put Angelo Dawkins and Montez Ford in the New Day? Why, because they're black? Fuck out of here, man. But purely with that kind of charisma, they are definitely on the level of a New Day. Both the, Street Pro- both the Street Profits and the members of the New Day, you know, they have that just overwhelmingly lovable charisma. Now, only time will tell what WWE does with Montez Ford and Angelo Dawkins in the meantime, because they could still do a lot in NXT if given the opportunity. I would love to see them stay in NXT and, and be a legit fucking tag team. I want to see them, you know, I, I think having the Street Profits in a feud for the NXT Tag Team Championships, that could be a very, very exciting feud, man. You know, the Street Profits have something that a lot of tag teams in WWE just struggle with so much, and that is getting over. That is is getting people to care about them. With Montez Ford and the way he comes off to the camera and his personality and his charisma and his... Just the the level of excitement that he brings to to a a WWE match. You, you, You pair that and Angelo Dawkins, man. You know, Angelo Dawkins I'm not a big fan of, but... He compliments Montez Ford as much as Montez Ford compliments Angelo Dawkins. Ford is the high flyer. Dawkins is grounded, you know? That's a very, very good pairing for both guys. It's a very good pairing for any tag team division, really. And the fact that NXT fans, WWE fans in general, just before they even step in the ring, they already love the Street Profits, that is going to get over with a lot of people on the main roster. And I think you add that to a WWE tag team title match or an NXT title match, just by default, you have a babyface team that that you want to see win, that everybody wants to see win. You know? I, I was here Wednesday saying that Montez Ford reminds me of a mini ricochet. You know? I, I w- I, I've been quoted on saying that Montez Ford, if you're looking to break out somebody out of this, out of this team and have them go on a singles run, it would undoubtedly be Montez Ford. You imagine what Montez Ford could do on 205 Live in the Cruiserweight division? Montez Ford has the makings of being a ricochet-like WWE talent. And if you put them on the main roster, there's no doubt in my mind that they'd get over. It's all up to management to deem them worthy enough to be in that position. That's why I wouldn't want them to be a part of the WWE main roster. If you have a plan for them, yes. But a team like that, I wish that they would... Let marinate just a little bit. Both guys are young. I'd love to see their 
their brand and their level of charisma in a tag team title feud. That's got the makings of a great environment and a great atmosphere. Let's do it. You know, but we don't know if Montez Ford is hurt or not. That's the only thing that's going on right now. But he's talking about Montez Ford and Angelo Dawkins being part of the New Day. I could see it. I could absolutely see it. So only time will tell, man. But to me, I think the value that the Street Profits bring to a WWE main roster act, uh, I think is very, very high at the, at the moment. And that's just based on what I've seen so far, the fan interaction to the Street Profits and their level of charisma. So we'll see what happens with the Street Profits, man. But I do think that out of all the tag teams in NXT, they are definitely at the top of the list for being a successful act on the main roster. Moving on here, man. We have another match to possibly be added to WWE Evolution. Now, the last match that was already announced is something that I'm looking very forward to seeing, and that is Kyrie Sane versus Shayna Baszler for the NXT Women's Championship. Now, Candice LeRae is currently feuding with Lacey Evans in a battle of traditional values versus modern woman. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw it out there right now. I know you guys feel the same way I do. I do not like, I never liked Lacey Evans' gimmick. I, I really never liked it at all. You know, she's gotten better in the year that I've watched her on NXT, but as far as the gimmick goes, to me, it's got levels of cringe that are exceeding max levels. I don't like it. I, I don't really care for it, and it doesn't do anything for me whatsoever. Now, while Evans is a throwback character from another era, Candace and her husband Johnny Gargano have both decided to put having children on the back burner while they focus on their careers in pro wrestling. Now, PW Insider Elite Audio has talked about this and talked about the feud between Evans and LeRae, and they said that Evans and LeRae might find themselves in a much bigger spotlight. They say, and I quote, this is when you go black and white versus color. You have the whole 1950s value with leave it to beaver, happy day, stay at home wife, caring for the husband. And Candace being the modern woman who's forged her own career path and has found someone in the same industry that she works in to form a power couple and want to concentrate on their careers, you know, first before they even talk about, you know, family life. So you've got this old school versus new school mentality and not doing it in a way where you sort of just sit there going, okay, we're going to have parodies of both kinds of women and kind of bastardize it. So we'll have to see where they go with this and if it leads to a match at Evolution. Who knows? Or maybe in a couple of weeks at the next set of WWE TV tapings for NXT. But it's also important for both women to remind us, hey, there are other women in the division other than Shayna and Kyrie Sane. And that's where NXT right now is kind of stuck. What they're doing with the women is great, but there's just so much talent in the women's division that on a one-hour show, it's almost humanly impossible to feature everybody. So you got to wait one week while two women are featured, and then those two women the next week sit out, and then you feature two more, and then rinse and repeat. This is why we haven't seen a lot of Nikki Cross and Bianca Belair. You know, they give us a little doses of them on the show, and they feature them where they can, and maybe in a backstage segment or an interview, or what Nikki Cross doing right now with William Regal that she knows who attacked Alice to Black. You know, Kyrie Sane and Shayna Baszler, clearly, they're the top of the of the program for the women. They're fighting over the NXT Women's Championship. They're going to have a match at Evolution. So clearly, that's going to be the match on the show that they're going to put most of their focus on. Candice LeRae and Lacey Evans, that's, a, that, that's an undercard feud, you know, to pretty much get both women's feet wet. That's probably going to be Lacey Evans' biggest match to date. That's going to get her in some sort of spotlight, whether it's at Evolution or not, just simply by being in the ring with Candice LeRae. But there's a lot of women in NXT that should be featured but are not. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. You know, if this was the main roster, where you have three hours of Raw and two hours of SmackDown, and you don't see for weeks on end, like we've seen with Asuka, that's a bad thing. With one hour of NXT television a week, you know, it's looked at as a good thing because A, it's one hour of television. We know that NXT is not going to waste Candice LeRae or Bianca Belair or Nikki Cross or anybody else that they're planning on building up because it's only a one hour show. It's simply a timing issue. 
They will be featured, but they have to they have to sit and wait their opportunity, they wait their time. More than likely, Shayna Baszler was getting called up after Evolution. No doubt in my mind. Kyrie Sand's going to be the women's champion at least going into WrestleMania. And if I'm Triple H and I'm battling New Japan Pro Wrestling at Madison Square Garden, take over we uh WrestleMania weekend for Takeover New Jersey or or Takeover Brooklyn whatever, whatever they're going to call it. It's going to be it's going to be at the Barclays Center. You know, I'm booking Kyrie versus Io Shirai. Simple as that. They're best friends. They've already mentioned that in passing on the episode four of the Mae Young Classic. So, if I'm Triple H, that's the match I'm booking for TakeOver. Simple as that. You want to put your best foot forward? There's no better foot than that. So, Shayna Baszler is getting called up to the main roster. I think she's ready. She's done so much in this one year to make me a huge fan of what she's doing. And you know that WWE, with all the four, four horsewomen being you know, in the company, you got Ronda and Shayna and Marina Shafir and Jessamyn Duke, they're all under a WWE contract. You know that they want to fast-track them all to the main roster. So Shayna is the next one in line. And then Marina and Jessamyn Duke are going to be the ones to follow. So she's getting called up. As soon as Shayna gets called up, Candice or Bianca is going to get moved up. Everybody's going to move up a spot. Nikki Cross is there to pretty much get Bianca Belair over. She's there to get talent over. She's going to be on the main roster as well. Because right now, the NXT women's division is almost busting at the seams. There's no need for Nikki Cross to be there anymore. There's no need for Shayna to be there anymore. They've done everything that they could. You're going to move them up to the main roster. So Candice and women like Candice and Lacey and everybody else, they're going to move on up just because of the timing. And the timing is going to come after Evolution. So it's all a waiting game. It's all a timing issue for these women. So I think it's going to be great. And Candice is not going to go unnoticed in NXT. It's it's almost impossible when her husband is who he is, Johnny Gargano. So give it time. I'm not sure if this is an Evolution match. I would say do this on NXT TV. But if you want to showcase what NXT has, then by all means do it. For Evolution. Uh, I I doubt that you put an NXT match on Evolution and you're going to get one complaint out of me. So we'll see what happens, man. That could possibly be added to Evolution. Only time will tell. Now, the WWE referee who was officiating the six-man tag, or six-woman tag on Monday Night Raw, the Liv Morgan Brie Bella incident, he was reportedly unaware of Liv Morgan's injury on Raw. I don't know how he was unaware when everybody said, this is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. How was he unaware when everybody watching at home knew that there was a fucking problem? I don't understand it. Liv Morgan has a concussion, and that is what it's being diagnosed as. She was on the road, not cleared or medically cleared to wrestle. She has a concussion thanks to two misplaced yes kicks from Brie Bella. But as more time has created distance between the event, we're getting much clearer pictures of the chaos that went around the situation. Now, according to Brian Alvarez, he discussed WWE side of the story after Lance Storm went on social media to talk about the subject of Liv Morgan's injury for a bit. This is Brian Alvarez, and I quote, Here's the WWE side of the story. So, they're in the ring, and Brie starts firing kicks. She hits one, two, three, four, five, six kicks. She gets the yes chance going, looking at the corner while she's throwing kicks, which is problem number one. That's how this whole thing got started. Like, I think a lot of people have pointed out that there is a much smaller target when you're trying to do yes kicks on a woman. You don't want to kick them in the boobs. You don't want to kick them in the head. Unlike a dude where you can kick them from the bottom of the sternum up. So she's got to be paying attention to her. That's number one. Good point on Brian Alvarez. That's a very good point. She's looking in the corner. She's throwing kicks at Liv Morgan. And the belief is she got knocked out on the first kick. She starts to fall forward and gets hit a second time. Which, by the way, is exceedingly dangerous to get hit a second time after the first time. And you know something is wrong. She goes down. And God bless the guy. I don't know. I don't want to be the guy 
you know, in that ring at that time. I don't want the guy to get fired. But I do know, and this goes off for every referee that works in the WWE, the story is the ref had no clue that Liv Morgan was unconscious. Alvarez then went on to question several things about this situation and how the referee couldn't know there was an issue in the ring. Now, I, I want to understand this. Everybody watching at home knew that there was an issue at home, there, in that moment. How didn't he know there was an issue? The woman slumped over and was completely fucking lifeless as Brie Bella tried to drag her to the corner. Brie Bella tried to drag her to the corner and she was legitimately dead weight. She couldn't even stand or have enough energy to push Brie Bella away and the referee, I don't know where he was or what he was doing or what he was looking at, but he must have been zoned out because everybody on that night knew there was an issue before Brie Bella dragged Liv Morgan to the corner. So, according to the referee, he didn't know that there was an issue in the ring. After all, he was right there in the ring, but for some reason, WWE's story seems to be the referee didn't know Liv Morgan was in trouble. Bullshit. So WWE not only has shills go on social media to defend this fucking garbage, but now they're giving you bullshit and feeding bullshit to the media. That would explain why he allowed Morgan to jump back in later and take part in a multi-woman suplex spot. But it was also noted that Brie Bella obviously knew Liv Morgan was out cold because she can be heard telling the other girls in the match, she's out. Apparently, they asked from the back what was going on and the referee got the message, so they took Liv Morgan out of the match. That is when you seen Dr. Aman come out to assist Liv Morgan, who was visibly shown on camera. The referee also apparently missed a pinfall attempt because he was watching what was going on with Morgan on the outside. The referee apparently told Morgan to get down from the apron, but nobody stopped her. This is when the suplex spot happened, and she rocked herself again. After three consecutive blows to the head, Morgan was finally out of the match, even though she wasn't actually taken to the back. This is all bullshit. It's complete bullshit. This is WWE feeding the fucking dirt sheets and feeding... The, 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 the masses, their story. I, I don't understand how you are an official. This guy obviously has been doing this for quite some time. I don't, know, I don't know the name of the official that was in this match. But everybody watching at home knew there was an issue. Within minutes, this shit was all over social media. So you are not going to tell me that the referee didn't know that there was a fucking issue in that ring. The referee didn't know he was unaware. And the only time that he knew is when Dr. Mom was on the outside. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. This is why WWE has guys like Corey Graves and everybody else that's WWE. You know? Come out and defend. Oh, accidents happen. It ain't ballet. WWE is obviously trying to kind of sweep this under the rug. You know, they don't want to address that Brie Bella is unfit to be in the ring. And the only reason that Brie Bella is in the ring is because they're pushing a certain initiative. And they can't do that without the Bella Twins. Bullshit. Obviously, fucking something was wrong there. And for the referee to not know that there was an issue in that moment, maybe Brie and the referee need to be taken out of commission for a little bit. Complete fucking nonsense. The last I'm going to talk about this shit. Everyone, I, I, there's no fucking way WWE has the balls to put Brie Bella back in the ring tonight. None. So I don't know what's going on with Brie Bella or Nikki Bella tonight on Monday Night Raw. All I know is if WWE even attempts to put this woman in the ring after what happened last night in the backlash, or last week rather, after the backlash, done. Keep this woman away. It's better enough we got to see her at fucking Super Showdown. Come on, man. Something that I am very excited about, man. Something that I am incredibly excited about because they're one of my favorite stables of all time. Evolution is reforming for SmackDown 1000. The last time Evolution was seen together was in 2014. They got back together to try and bring down The Shield. Triple H, Randy Orton, and Batista ultimately were unsuccessful in their attempts. Since then, Triple H has continued to work in a backstage capacity, clearly, Randy Orton is a 13-time world champion. Batista has become one of the biggest 
box office draws in Hollywood. But some very exciting news regarding the group has emerged from WWE and has everything to do with SmackDown's 1,000th episode. It was confirmed by Mike Rome that WWE is bringing back Evolution for one night only on October 16th in Washington, D.C. And that would mean Batista's tweet towards the company saying he hadn't been invited to the celebration was well and truly noted, duly noted by the powers that be. On the whole, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense considering Evolution were never really a SmackDown thing. They were always exclusively a Raw thing during their prime. But WWE wants to make this as big and as special as could be. Why the fuck not? You ain't gonna get a complaint out of me. But WWE are clearly trying to load this card up to boost ticket sales and viewership numbers. Whether it works remains to be seen, but the return of Evolution is surely a positive step in making that happen. Evolution is undoubtedly one of the most influential and legendary groups of all time. The group which consisted of Triple H, Batista, Ric Flair, and Randy Orton. All four of which, by the way, will be on SmackDown Live 1000. Made a lasting impression on the fans and the wrestling universe for a very long time. The faction debuted back in January 20, 2003, lasted till 2005. They had brief reunions in 2007 and 2014. And were reportedly disbanded back on June 2, 2014. However, judging by the fact that they are coming back together in any capacity, it seems that evolution will pretty much never die. Now, if WWE wants to make a storyline here, <coughs> excuse me, WWE wants to continue the storyline of where Evolution last left off, you know, Batista's been lobbying for a match with Triple H as a retirement match at WrestleMania. If WWE wants to really get the ball rolling here, you know, Batista and Triple H at WrestleMania, they could certainly make that happen with this Evolution reunion. And that's the only match Batista wants at WrestleMania. He wants Triple H to retire him at WrestleMania, and being that Dwayne Johnson's already going to be tied up in the Roman Initiative, I think that could be a very, very good role for Triple H if you want to get him in his obligatory match at WrestleMania. So, during previous reports, WWE confirmed that Evolution will be reuniting at the 1,000th episode of SmackDown Live. In response to this, the current SmackDown Live superstar, Randy Orton, and Triple H both tweeted out responses. At this time, Flair has only tweeted the announcement, and Batista has not made any active announcement on social media to anything. First, Orton claimed that Evolution was the most dominant faction that the WWE has ever created. You know, it's it's up for discussion. You know, WWE created. I think they're much better than the fucking Shield. The Shield ain't number one on any fucking list. I would rank Evolution way above the Shield. It, it goes, you know... In modern day, I'm not talking about like all time, modern day WWE. You're going to go probably DX and then you're probably going to do Evolution. Simple as that. Those are the top two. Now, what Randy Orton tweeted out was he said that, like I said, the faction of Evolution was the most dominant faction in WWE, the most dominant faction that his employer has ever created. Now, Triple H reminded everybody that the group represented the past, the future, and the present in WWE. A group created to ensure the, 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 the past, the present, and the future of WWE, and they return on a historic night. Hashtag then, now, forever. Hashtag everything evolves. Hashtag evolve or perish. The 1,000th episode of SmackDown Live will take place in Washington, D.C., which is Batista's hometown on October 16th. 49 world championship reigns between all four members of the group. That is Flair, Orton, Batista, and Triple H. The group certainly has a lot of credentials to make an impact on that show. What they're going to be doing, I don't know. But what I do know is that DX came back on Monday Night Raw 25th anniversary and embarrassed the revival. We don't need anything like that to happen. I wish these guys would be factored into a fucking storyline. We don't need them ruining or burying a tag team on the roster that will, will never live up to the fucking credentials of the group of Evolution. So come on. Put these guys in a fucking storyline that is built over the entire show instead of getting them out there to get a cheap pop to bury a tag team and then move on. You know? Here we are, guys. Cheer for us. Buy tickets to the show to see us and then watch us do nothing. That's what I'm afraid that WWE is planning on these guys for SmackDown Live 
1,000. But I'm excited to see them, man. And maybe, like I said, it gets Batista back into good graces with WWE. Maybe Batista is going to try and talk his way into get, you know being at WrestleMania and getting back on WWE television. I would love to see Hollywood dick like Batista back on WWE television. One more run is what he wants. He's claimed he loves it. He misses it. Get him back. One of the very, very few guys that I would actually love to see come back portrayed this time correctly. Let's see what happens, man. Finally, we're going to end this podcast off, man. We're going to end 241 Part 3 with some sad news because this one hits close to home. CNN founder and former WCW owner Ted Turner revealed during an interview with CBS Sunday Morning he has been diagnosed with dementia. It's a mild case of what people call Alzheimer's, Turner says. It's similar to that, but not nearly as bad. I thought dementia was bad. I thought dementia was worse than Alzheimer's. He says, it's similar to that, but not nearly as bad. Alzheimer's is fatal. Thank goodness I don't have that. After a pause, Turner said, dementia, I can't remember what my disease is. So, on this CBS Sunday morning interview, he was already, you you could kind of see the effects. I haven't seen it. You could kind of see the effects of what the, you know, the disease is already doing to him. Turner was asked about the symptoms of the disease. He said, Tired, exhausted, that's the main symptoms, and forgetfulness. The 70-year-old is best known for wrestling fans, or two wrestling fans, as the man who purchased Jim Crockett Promotions in 1998 and renamed it to World Championship Wrestling. There were times when rumors would surface about the impending demise of the company, but Turner, a longtime wrestling fan, had a soft spot for WCW and did everything he could to keep it alive even when business was soft in 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 the early 90s. The company closed after he lost control of it to AOL Time Warner, and the merger that happened, and WWE stepped in to buy the tape library. Turner is known for much more than what he did for wrestling, but for those of you who uh, are in the wrestling realm, his legacy will include what he did in the mid-90s when WCW became the number one promotion for a couple years, and they came close to putting Vince McMahon and WWF out of business. This interview will air, if you guys want to, actually, actually, it actually happened last night, uh, yesterday. This interview will air Sunday, uh, if you guys can find it online at some point, uh, Sunday it aired at 9 a.m. Eastern on CBS. So you guys could, could probably find that on CBS.com if you want. Um, you know, being, being that I'm a huge Atlanta Braves fan, you know, he, he owned the Atlanta Braves as well. He was at every Atlanta Braves game, man. You know, he was a, a big deal to the Braves organization, man. He was also a big deal as to why they were the team of the 90s, and he was a big reason, and, and Ted Turner was a huge reason why they were so successful in the 90s, winning 14 NL East championships, man. You know, that's unprecedented. Obviously, their failures are going to get more no, no notice than anything, but the fact that a team headed by Ted Turner won 14 straight division titles, man, that's unheard of. So Ted Turner was at the forefront of their success as well, as well as WCW, you know? That love and passion for wrestling is what, is what drove WCW to even came come close to, to taking Vince McMahon out. You know, so it, it, it's it's with a sad heart that, you know, you got to read that Ted Turner's battling dementia, man. You guys know my history. You guys know my grandfather passed away from Alzheimer's. You know, I didn't know that dementia was not fatal. Alzheimer's I know is, but I, I, thought, it was, I thought dementia was a step worse than, than Alzheimer's. But my Aunt Teresa is going through the same thing right now, man. She's not even she's not even in her 70s. Now, I don't know how long she has, but it's the same thing as my grandfather. It's kind of, you know, you're just waiting for the inevitable, you know? And, and to see my grandfather go through that, man, I don't, I don't want to see anybody go through that. That's just a terrible fucking thing to see. Uh, you know, someone who was just so strong and successful and powerful, right? Kind of wither away into nothing. It's just a, a sad thing to see. So, you know, my thoughts and prayers go out to Ted Turner, man. So I, I wanted to let you guys know about that. That was uh, definitely, you know, a, a sad thing to come across in the news feed. Ted Turner reveals his battle with dementia. And, you know, it's just, I don't want to see anybody go through that at all, man. So, you know, thoughts and prayers to wh- whomever is listening that uh, has a family member or friend going through that, man. It's not, it's not a fun thing to see or hear. And my thoughts and prayers go out to Ted Turner. Uh, with his battle with dementia, man. So, you know, that's off the script. 
Episode 241, it's part number three for your Monday, man. We'll be back tonight with Monday Night Raw, the go-home show for Super Showdown. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, man, let's try and let's try and nail 1,500 likes on this video. So if we could do that, I would greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate that. I'll see you guys tonight for Monday Night Raw. Follow me on Twitter, man, at JD from NY206. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on that bell for all notifications. If you guys missed any of the other content that I uploaded this past weekend, you guys know where to find it in the top right corner in that drop-down annotation. So go check that stuff out. And please, show some love to my sponsors, man. Barbershopwindow.com slash off the script. Harry's.com slash script. Audibletrial.com slash off the script. And if you guys want to support the podcast, Patreon.com slash JD from NY 206, man. I'll be back tonight for Monday Night Raw, the go-home show for Super Showdown. Tweeting live on Twitter, as always. And I'll see you guys tonight for the review of Monday Night Raw. I'll talk to you later.